I'm Marty Mackenzie Murray, an author and journalist. Sure, it's The Speechwriter. Uh, it's a novel, which is unusual for me. Uh, I'm a journo. So this was a desperate improvisation and also an attempt to write comedy, something I'm also new at. So uh, perhaps the readers will better judge if I was successful in being funny. Uh, it's a prison memoir by Toby Beaverbrook, who as a young boy was eccentrically idealistic, had high hopes, pure but unreasonable hopes that he might change the world by putting fancy words in the mouths of powerful people. And it ends with him in prison. And the book is him saying why, how he ended there from this point of eccentric idealism through gradual stages of corruption, despair, and ultimately uh, criminal nihilism. Uh, so yeah, it's a journey from, from childhood to, to where he is now, but all told or penned from his prison cell. I unfortunately was a speechwriter myself, so politically and uh, governmentally. Beginning in Western Australia, I was a uh, young or junior speechwriter for a premiere, and then moved to Canberra for three years where I was principally a speechwriter. And this grew out of very profound frustration uh, with my work. And I wanted to sort of purge myself a little bit of the various frustrations. I never became criminally nihilistic like my my counterpart here, but I would go to the National Library on weekends and sort of start penning a TV comedy about life in departments. Having a speechwriter as a character sort of show some of the machinery and logic of politics, the place of language in politics, but also the individual's vanity and that aspect of um, the speechwriter. Uh, my first was A Murder Without Motive. Again, very, very, very different. Uh, it was non-fiction. True crime, I always hesitate still, five years after publishing that book, to use that tag, true crime, because I think most of true crime is <sighs> cheaply titillating, voyeuristic. They're cheap, largely. There's also some superb crime reporting. But this was, I, I found with true crime that the focus was principally upon the killers. The killer in this case um, wasn't terribly interesting and the book was about a lot of things. Toxic masculinity um, was a big part of it. My upbringing was a part of it. But the book's heart was the parents of the murder victim. Uh, the victim was a 19 year old woman and they were exceptionally candid and trusting and also exceptionally articulate about their grief. It's un unusual. And so that became the heart of, of that book. Very, very, very different book. And that's one reason to write comedy, I guess, is for five and a half years, I was the chief correspondent of the Saturday paper. I now write periodic journalism and columns now. And that's largely about chronicling human depravity. And I wanted, even if it was part-time, even a hobby, I began writing this without a contract. I didn't show anyone for a while. Uh, just on the side to sort of think about comedy, to research comedy, and to attempt comedy was something of a relief for me. Big question. There is a compulsion, I'm sorry to say. In this instance though, it's often very specific. So it's, it's perhaps a creative uh, answer to a problem. And my problem was that immersion in depravity and sadness and grief. I had done a lot of reporting on those suffering various um, deprivations. Did a lot of reporting on sexual abuse victims. So this book was really an attempt, perhaps vain, to see if I could do something different um, and also to treat myself to some sort of escape from that after many, many, many years. Um, as with my first book, why I wrote it was curiosity and that's probably large answer to much of my writing about why I do it. It's to find out why something is, journalistically. During the big lockdown, writing was difficult. Uh, I had a young child, still do, but was one at the start of the pandemic. In fact, her first birthday kind of coincided with police patrolling supermarkets. Um, 
So it was something done in the evenings. The book writing was done in the evening, so it's still a, a few hours away. And I became, I found with Melbourneian French during the lockdown, one of two things happened. This is a bit of a generalization, but one of two things happened. Fell into a funk of despair and became very unproductive. Or, and I've met a few people like this, and I was one of them, became maniacally productive. And I think that's because I had this very acute, probably neurotic sense of time being stolen from me. Um, a year, not that we knew it would be a year or, or longer or less, but time being stolen. And that sort of spurred me even more. So I ended up writing a TV comedy. Um, I started a third book, obviously finished this book. Uh, and then there was my usual journalism. In fact, I, for a while I was writing political speeches there in that year. So yeah, there was this something, and looking back upon it, I don't know if it was terribly healthy, this, this productivity. There was a certain mania to it. Um, but yeah, that was, that was lockdown. Ooh. I thought, I didn't read this in 2020, but I thought about it a lot and still do. There are a few books that keep coming back to me. So in the context of writing comedy, I thought a lot about Paul Beatty's The Sellout. And he became the first American to win the Booker just a few years ago. It's extraordinary, extraordinary satire. And, but what I principally think about is not so much the themes, but the effervescence of the sentences. On a sentence level, he is just extraordinary. These are fizzy, extraordinary sentences. The power, the propulsion of it. And it's a book largely without plot, and it doesn't much matter because the riffs are so extraordinarily funny. And unusually for a satire, it is funny. I think a lot of satires are too dry or wry or clever and a little self-regarding in their wit, but very few are very funny and the sellout is, is one of them. And I thought about it a lot. It, it, it's, it's intimidating though to think about it and to, I, I can't hold my book up to it. I mean, that is, that is a very, very high bar, but I, th I thought about that book a lot. My tastes weren't terribly sophisticated for a long time. It was principally juvenile detective fiction. So it began with the Hardy Boys and the Three Investigators. And there was this very weird, crude partition between the boys and the girls. And so the girls had Trixie Belden and Nancy Drew, but I consumed all of them. I didn't care for this weird partition that publishers had kind of uh, confected. So it was that, I just, I, just, oh, I, I just ate them all up. But that didn't inspire me so much to be a writer, but a detective. And so at the, I think at the age of 10, I set up a little detective agency in the hope that uh, frustrated police officers would need some leads and come my way. Of course, that didn't, didn't happen. Um, but yeah, it was juvenile detection, uh, juvenile detective fiction, a lot. And what else? I saw it on the bookshelf the other day and I remember loving uh, Roald Dahl's two memoirs, Boy and Going Solo. Um, I was very fond of as a kid as well. First thing I ever wrote, there was a poem published in the school's newsletter called The Vulture. And I was writing at a young age, and then high school became an extremely fallow period where no books were read. Very few sentences were written. I was, I was concerned about sport and music, and that's about it. But in primary school, yeah, I was writing my own little books, a lot of poetry, very, very earnest stuff about opium importation and acid rain and climate change and the decimation of whales, all of the, the these big, particularly the triads, the, the menacing, yeah, my lord, uh, this precocious, but, but in retrospectively kind of weird uh, and pathetic concern for things that I never really understood. <laughs> but I would, write, I would write poetry about these things. Uh, well, what's next? I've just signed a contract for a biography of Daniel Andrews. Uh, so very, well, I was gonna say very different. It's, it's not gonna be comedy, but I guess it continues the theme of politics. And I'm working on a script, uh, which is comedy, um, of animals in therapy. So animals that present to a human therapist who is blundering and increasingly realizes he's completely out of his depth and as a human is somehow involved or complicit in their suffering. Um, so a redback spider who is haunted by all the lovers she's had to eat. 
uh, a cat who's terrified of her curiosity. Uh, curiosity has killed her brother, <laughs> uh, which a coroner's port report <laughs> has confirmed. So she's wondering whether or not to have this barren intellectual life um, uh, at the risk of, um, or she can be curious and suffer the consequences. So there's various animals that, that kind of submit um, themselves to the therapist. So I'm working on that as well. You're welcome.